Hello. In this video, I provide a general introduction to binary logistic regression and discuss how to interpret regression output based on an analysis using the Jamovi program. Jamovi is an open source program that can be freely downloaded at this site right here. I will begin my discussion with a general overview of binary logistic regression and then proceed with an example in which I, I analyze a set of data. This PowerPoint will be made available for download under the video description and incorporates more detail than I provided in the video. The data set is available for download as well at this link right here and I will make it available underneath the video description. The data are contained in an SPSS file which can be imported directly into Jamovi. Finally, the demonstration incorporates some discussion of the use of dummy variables when factor variables are input as predictors. So I have another video that covers dummy coding, albeit in SPSS, and you can go here to learn more about it if you need to. So let's go ahead and get started. Binary logistic regression is utilized when a researcher desires to model the relationship between one or more predictor variables and a binary dependent variable. Fundamentally, the researcher is addressing the question, what is the probability that a given case falls into one of two categories on the dependent variable, given the predictors in the model? Now, one might be inclined to ask, why don't we use standard ordinary least squares regression or OLS regression instead of binary logistic regression? OLS regression assumes that there is a linear relationship between the independent variables and dependent variable, and the residuals are normally distributed and exhibit constant variance. All three assumptions are violated if the outcome variable in an OLS model is binary. And pivoting off A, the relationship between one's predictor variables and the probability of target outcome uh, is inherently nonlinear and takes on an S-shaped curve. This is because probabilities are bounded at 0 and 1. When modeling a binary outcome using OLS regression, the estimation of model parameters ignores this boundedness, which has a notable effect of producing predicted probabilities that fall outside the 0 to 1 range. Binary logistic regression estimates regression parameters by taking into account the fact that probabilities are bounded at 0 and 1. It also does not assume that residuals are normally distributed and exhibits constant variance. So because of this, Osborne classifies binary logistic regression as a non-parametric technique. Now, although the relationship between predictors and the probability of target group membership is inherently nonlinear, binary logistic regression still relies on a linear function to model that relationship. It does so by using a link function that converts the nonlinear relationship in this case reflected in an S-shaped curve, into one that is linear. So one might say that binary logistic regression linearizes the previous nonlinear relationship. Unfortunately, this process transforms the fitted values on the dependent variable from a metric that is fairly intuitive, that is, the probability of target group membership, into one that is rather non-intuitive, that is, the log odds of target group membership, which is also referred to as the logit. As such, the regression coefficients in the model are interpreted as the predicted increase in log odds associated with target group membership per unit increase on the predictor. So here we have an equation and we see that a person's predicted logit is a function of the predictors in the model. The logit is equal to the natural log of the person's odds of being in the target group. And the person's predicted odds of target group membership is a ratio of the probability of target group membership to the probability of non-target group membership. So to make things a bit more concrete, the equation below shows the relationship between the probability of an event, we'll call it A, and the odds for that event. And as you can see, the odds for an event is simply a ratio of the probability of the event to the probability that the event does not occur. So there's the probability of event A to the probability that it does not occur. So you may be thinking this is more intuitive than log odds and, think, and also thinking, why don't we model the relationship between the predictors and the odds of target group membership? The reason is that although there is no upper bound to the odds, it is still bounded at zero on the lower end. As such, the relationship between predictors and the odds would still be nonlinear. By taking the natural log of the odds, which results in logits, we now have a dependent variable that is unbounded as potential values for the logit can range from negative infinity to positive infinity. And as a result, we can model the relationship between the predictors and the outcome using a linear function. 
So to help you visualize the relationship between a predictor and the predicted probability, predicted odds, and predicted logit associated with target group membership, I ran a binary logistic regression in SPSS with the variable terminate, coded zero equals uh, did not terminate early, one equals terminate early, serving as the outcome of a single predictor, which is basically avoidance of disclosure. And these are variables that we're going to include or uh, be using in uh, the example coming up. So when running the model, I save the predicted probability of a person falling into the terminated early group and then computed the predicted odds and predicted logits for each person. So you can see right here that uh, these three columns represent those um, predicted values. So here you can see uh, in the plot on the left, this one right here, um, we have the predicted probabilities of target group membership uh, as a function of the predictor, which is avoidance of disclosure. And you can see that it takes on that notable S-shaped curve. Not drawn very well, but you can see we have the, bound, uh, that, uh, the probabilities which are bounded at 0 and 1. So you can see that curvature. So it's not, there's no uh, linear function there. Now if we convert um, our um, predicted probabilities into odds, then you can see we get this right here. And so you can see that in this case, we still also do not have a linear function. So if we plot the uh, predicted logits against the um, independent variable in the model, you can see that now we have a linear function that is represented. Okay, a couple of final notes before we get started with the example. Um, in terms of model estimation, unlike OLS regression, binary logistic regression typically uses maximum likelihood to estimate model parameters. Maximum likelihood estimation is an iterative process aimed at arriving population parameter values that are most likely to have produced the observed sample data. Now in general, this estimation approach assumes large samples and, aside from issues of power, smaller sample sizes can also create problems with model convergence and estimation of parameters. So uh, just as a side note, with smaller samples there are other types of binary logistic regression, such as exact logistic regression, or utilizing the first procedure with uh, penalized maximum likelihood. Unfortunately, these options are not commonly available in uh, many statistics programs. When it comes to evaluation on model fit, um, we also consider uh, fit at two levels. So typically, one evaluates the fit of the full model containing the full set of predictors uh, first. So in binary logistic regression, this can be done using a likelihood ratio chi-square test, which compares the full model against a null or intercept-only model. Um, we can also evaluate overall fit using various pseudo R-square uh, uh, indices. And we can evaluate the degree to which the model is able to correctly classify into uh, individuals or cases into groups on the dependent variable. Following this, one typically evaluates the individual predictors for their contribution to overall model fit. So this is done uh, either by using the wall test or likelihood ratio test, which the latter involves comparing the full model with all the predictors against a reduced model with a given predictor removed. So let's get started with our example uh, using Jamovi. So as a scenario, in this example we are attempting uh, or rather, we are predicting the likelihood of early termination from counseling in a sample of 45 clients at a community mental health center. The dependent variable in the model is terminate, which is coded 1, terminated early, or 0, uh, did not terminate early. So where the did not terminate group is considered the reference or baseline category, and the terminated early group is the target category. Two predictors in the model are categorical, that is gender identification, coded zero, identified as male, one is identified as female, and income, which is an ordinal variable, which is coded one for low income, two for medium income, and three for high income. The reference category for the gender identification uh, variable is male identification, whereas the reference category for income is the low income group. Finally, two predictors are assumed continuous in the model, avoidance of disclosure, and symptom severity. So here you see I've opened up the Jamovi program and I have the variables included. So there's the terminate variable coded 0 and 1. 
uh, avoidance of disclosure and symptom severity. Both of these are scale variables. Gender ID is um, a nominal variable right here. And then we also have income, which is our ordinal variable. And it's, it has codes of one, two, and three, which you can see right here, the value labels of low, medium, and high. So let's run our logistic regression. So we're gonna go first to the regression box at the top, so this, and then we'll click on two outcomes, binomial. So I'm gonna click on that button right there, and this opens up. And so now what's gonna happen is as we, at, as we make changes on the left, those changes are gonna be uh, reflected on the right in terms of the output. So the nice thing about the Jamovi program is, is that you can uh, see changes in your output in real time as you make uh, changes in terms of model specification and various options. So let's start, we'll move terminate over to the dependent variable box. We'll move avoidance of disclosure and symptom severity over to the covariates box. And then the factors box will include our two categorical uh, predictor variables. So I'm gonna move these over to the factors box. Uh, just so you know, technically speaking, gender ID um, is already dummy coded in this particular data set. Because it has two levels, you could actually incorporate it as a covariate. But I'm just going to go ahead and leave it as a, in the factors box uh, for this particular demonstration. Income, though, would have to be incorporated as a factor. So now, if I click under Model uh, Builder, you'll notice that uh, the predictors on the left appear in block one on the right. So technically speaking, we could actually carry out uh, hierarchical uh, logistic regression if we wanted to by uh, adding predictors in various blocks. But we're all we're basically going to be incorporating the predictors all in the same um, at the same time. So you'll also notice that in terms of the um, output so far, you'll see that we have the McFadden pseudo R square value, we have the deviance value right here, and then the Akaiki's information criterion value right here. So all of these are defaults. And we all also have the model coefficients table where we have, uh, we have the predictors, the estimates, standard error, Z values, and P values. Uh, down here under gender ID, you can see that it's basically a uh, dummy coded variable with uh, codes of zero and one reflecting male uh, and female respectively. Uh, we have the estimates and so forth. And then down below where income, you'll see that these two variables right here, these are actually dummy variables uh, where the low group is um, coded zero across those two dummy variables. So let's now go to uh, the reference variables box. So now under here, you'll see that uh, this is where we have to, with our uh, categorical variables, we have to specify, specify um, a, a reference or a baseline category. So the terminate uh, dependent variable, the reference category is zero, which is did not terminate early. So um, we're gonna leave that alone. For gender ID, uh, we wanted um, basically male identification to be the baseline or reference category. So we're gonna leave this as zero right here. And then for income, we're gonna leave the low group as the baseline or reference category. But you can see that there, in theory, you could actually make changes to which group would be treated as um, the baseline uh, category. If we click under assumption checks, uh, one of the nice things that you have available is uh, collinearity statistics. So we can actually ask for the variance inflation factor and tolerance statistics for each of the predictors within the model. Uh, under model fit, you'll see that some of the defaults are already clicked. So you see the deviance in, in AIC or Akaiki's information criterion, McFadden pseudo R square. So all those are uh, defaulted, but we can also click on BIC um, Bayesian information criterion, the overall model test, which is the likelihood ratio test I was telling you about earlier, which is a comparison of the full model against an intercept only model. Then we also have various uh, other pseudo R squares like Cox and Snails and Nagel Kirky's pseudo R square values. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on all of these just to kind of show you what that what this would look like. So you can see uh, all of that information is filled out um, in, in the, the um, first part of the output. Now, when we click under model coefficients, we can also ask for likelihood ratio tests uh, for the individual predictors in the model, which is one of the uh, ways we can actually test those predictors. Um, by default, uh, under model coefficients, uh, the Z tests that we have right here, these are 
this is the wall test. So uh, if we wanted to use the likelihood ratio test to test the individual predictors, then we have to click this box right here. We can also click on odds ratio if we want uh, to obtain the odds ratios associated with the uh, predictors in the model. And if we want a confidence interval for the uh, odds ratios, we can click this button as well. Finally, uh, if we click on prediction right here, uh, we can actually get a classification table um, along, so we can kind of scroll down right here, uh, along with um, sort of a table reflecting the accuracy or the, you know, the proportion of correctly classified cases based on the model, uh, and then sensitivity and specificity, which you can get right here. So all of those are shown um, as well in the output. So let's take a few minutes and interpret the results. And actually, I have them in, in my uh, PowerPoint file, and I'm just going to kind of go through it this way. So first off, you'll see the box that's uh, around the overall model test. This is the chi-square. This is the likelihood uh, ratio chi-square test, which is evaluating whether the fit of the model containing the full set of predictors is a significant improvement in fit over a null or intercept-only model. So it is an omnibus test of the null hypothesis that the regression slopes for all the predictors in the model are equal to zero. So if this is statistically significant, as we see right here, then this would indicate that the model, the full model is a better fit to the data than the null model. The values that you see right here uh, in the box are pseudo R-square values. So they're not computed in the same way as R-square and least squares regression. Uh, so you have to think about them as sort of rough analogies to R square. So the uh, the the uh, this uh, index right here, this is McFadden pseudo R square. This is the Cox and Snell pseudo R square, and this is a Nagel Kirky uh, pseudo R square value, or rather uh, index. So according to Osborne, uh, the literature really provides little guidance on how to interpret different variants of the pseudo R squares. Uh, leading him to actually reject offering suggestions on their use. Um, similarly, uh, Lomax and Haas Vaughn note that there's no consensus on which is best. Uh, as such, researchers often choose not to report them. So I do want to note that, you know, typically when pseudo R square uh, um, indices are, are discussed in the literature, it's oftentimes sort of more of a, a computational or mathematical treatment of the topic, but there's not a really a whole lot of information about um, how to, you know, how to judge, um, you know, how large or small an effect really is. I will note that uh, referencing McFadden, Pittick and Stevens from 2016 and Tabachnik and Fidel in their uh, book suggest that values ranging at least between 2.2 and 0.4 may be indicative of good or a uh, very good fit. So even so, these values cannot be reasonably applied in every situation. Okay, so the next uh, part of the output uh, shows you the deviance uh, statistic, the Akaiki's information criterion, or AIC, and the Bayesian information criterion, or the BIC. So the deviance statistic is an indicator of badness of fit, and it's particularly useful in logistic regression when one is comparing nested models. Uh, that is, in circumstances where one model is a subset of another. The AIC and BIC can be used with both nested and non-nested models, um, and so are applicable when comparing nested models um, in the same fashion as deviance. The difference is that the AIC and BIC um, include a penalty for model complexity, which is a function of the number of parameters that are estimated. So in general, when multiple models are being tested or considered, the one with the lowest deviance, AIC or BIC, is the preferred model. And as a side note, sometimes it is the case that one may obtain AIC or BICs that are negative. And when this occurs, the model with the AIC or BIC values that are kind of, quote, most negative is preferred. So in other words, if you can imagine a number line that runs from negative infinity to positive infinity, models with AIC or BIC values that are closer to negative infinity relative to all the others um, is a preferred model. Okay, so looking at the um, model coefficients table, we have an estimates column right here, which contains the regression coefficients. We also have the standard errors, Z values, and P values in order to test those regression coefficients. So for each predictor, the regression slope is the predicted change in the log odds of falling into the target group as compared to the reference group on the dependent variable.
Um, and this is per one unit increase on the predictor. So uh, kind of uh, going over that one more time, for each predictor, the regression slope is a predicted change in log odds of falling into the target group per one unit increase on the predictor. And this is controlling for the remaining predictors. So a common misconception is that the regression coefficient indicates the predicted change in the probability of target group membership per unit increase on the predictor. And this is basically wrong. The coefficient is the predicted change in log odds. So there is a difference there. Nevertheless, you can generally interpret a positive regression coefficient as indicating the probability, loosely speaking, of falling into the target group is increasing as a result of increases on the predictor variable. And that a negative coefficient indicates the probability, again, loosely speaking, of target membership decreases with increases on the predictor. So if the regression coefficient is equal to zero, this can be taken to indicate the changes in the probability of being in the target group um, um, or the likelihood or probability of being in the target group is not changing as a function of the predictor. So when you're carrying out your significance test, you're fundamentally testing whether the regression coefficient is significantly different from the null uh, regression coefficient of zero. Now the odds ratio column that you see right here uh, contains values that are interpreted as a mul multiplicative change in odds for every one unit increase on a predictor. So in general, an odds ratio that's greater than one indicates that as scores on the predictor increase, there's an increasing probability of the case falling into the target group on the dependent variable. An odds ratio that is less than one can generally be interpreted as decreasing probability of being in the target group as, a mem as scores on the predictor increase. And if the odds ratio is equal to one, then this indicates no change in the probability of being in the target group as scores on the predictor in, uh, change. So the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio can also be used to test the observed odds ratio to determine if it is statistically significantly different from uh, the null uh, hypothesis or the null hypothesized odds ratio of one. So if one falls between the lower and the upper bound for a given interval, then the computed odds ratio is not statistically significantly different from one, which is indicating no change as a function of the predictor. So let's go ahead and interpret some of the um, uh, regression coefficients uh, in our table. So you can see right here we have avoidance of disclosure um, and the regression slope is positive and statistically significant. So it's indicating that avoidance of disclosure is a positive and significant predictor of the probability of early termination. The odds ratio, which you see right here, is 1.472. And basically what this means is, is that for every one unit increase on avoidance of disclosure, uh, the odds of early termination increase by a factor or change by a factor of 1.472. Now, symptom severity in this, um, in this uh, coefficients table is a negative and significant predictor of the probability of early termination. And the odds ratio indicates that for every one unit increment on the predictor, the odds of terminating increase by a factor of 0 0.05, which actually means that the odds are decreasing. Uh, gender ID is a non-significant predictor of early termination in the model. But had the predictor been significant, then the negative coefficient would have been taken as an indicator that females, which were coded 1, are less likely to terminate early than males, which were coded 0. Finally, as I noted before, income is represented by two dummy variables. The first dummy variable is a comparison of the medium income group, which is coded uh, 1 on that variable, and the low income group, which is coded 0 on that variable. So the negative coefficient suggests that persons in the medium income category were less likely to terminate early than those in the low income category. Nevertheless, the dif difference was not statistically significant. Similarly, the second dummy variable compares the high income group and the low income group. Nevertheless, the uh, difference between the two groups was not statistically significant. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the tests uh, that you see in the model coefficients table are called wall tests. And one downside of this test is that it can be overly conservative, which can lead to increased likelihood of committing a type 2 error. So we also have the likelihood ratio test, uh, which is uh, generally viewed as more kind of superior to the wall test. So as you can see here, although the tests do not suggest any differences in interpretation concerning the significance of the predictors, um, 
you know, you can also see that uh, the p values generally uh, are tending to be smaller. Also, note that the income variable that you see in this particular um, uh, table. Uh, is testing the overall effect of group income differences, whereas up here the effect of income is sort of distributed across those two dummy variables. Okay, finally, in terms of our interpretation, the results here provide further information concerning the adequacy of the model in predicting group membership on the dependent variable. The classification table that you see in the upper right gives you cell frequencies representing the correspondence between observed and predicted group membership. We see that essentially 92% of cases that were observed, um, that, uh, that the were observed not to terminate early, were cor correctly predicted by the model to not terminate early. Of the 20 cases observed to terminate early, 75% of those cases were correctly predicted by the model to terminate early. So as you can see in terms of the percentages uh, for each of these rows right here, they actually appear down below. And so you can see that um, the percentage correct um, in the first row is referring to the specificity and the, sec the percentage associated with the second one is associated with sensitivity. So basically, sensitivity refers to the accuracy of the model in predicting target group membership, whereas specificity refers to the accuracy of a model to predict non-target group membership. You also see that the overall classification accuracy based on the model was about 84.4%. Okay, so that pretty much uh, concludes this review of binary logistic regression, uh, including a review of uh, Jamovi and how to carry out binary logistic regression using that program. Um, at the end of the uh, PowerPoint, you'll see a slide that contains references and resources that were used to put together the PowerPoint. So be sure to check that out. So um, at any rate, that concludes this uh, video, and I appreciate you watching.